Greetings, dear subscribers and casual listeners of my channel. In fact, with Nagini, Rowling created a very good narrative loop because she is one of the central characters in the Fantastic Beasts film series and a link to the main character of the Harry Potter series. Nagini is a very ambiguous character, and we know very little about her past. However, the Fantastic Beasts film revealed many new and interesting things about her, leaving no doubt that Nagini is a maledictus, carrying a blood curse. By the way, some fans once speculated that Rowling came up with Nagini's story specifically for Fantastic Beasts. Someone even asked her on Twitter when exactly she invented Nagini's storyline, and Rowling replied, for around 20 years. There's another fact proving that Rowling indeed knew who Voldemort's snake really was. If we look at the etymology of the name Nagini, we see a direct reference to a mythological creature from Indian folklore that is half woman, half snake. By giving Nagini this name, Rowling was well aware of her essence and true nature. Surely you've noticed that the maledictus is something between an animagus and a werewolf. A werewolf, as we know, cannot control their transformations, while an animagus can. In Nagini's case, we see traits of both. She is powerless against the fact that one day she will permanently become a snake. But until that happens, she can voluntarily transform into a snake and back into a human. In Fantastic Beasts, Nagini is portrayed as a 28 to 30 year old woman. The events take place in 1926 to 1927, meaning that by the time she dies during the Battle of Hogwarts, 1998, she is over 90 years old. On average, snakes like the one Nagini turned into live about 20 years, which suggests that a maledictus trapped in an animal's body is likely immune to aging and cannot die a natural death. So, let's remember who Nagini was before she became Voldemort's servant and Horcrux. In Fantastic Beasts, we clearly see that she opposed Grindelwald's regime and refused to support him. We are shown a quiet and modest woman with a kind heart and compassion for others. It's possible that the evil in her soul was born from the very curse that locked her in the body of a snake, as that body, which became her eternal prison, was never her true nature, for Nagini was born in a completely different form. It's likely that her anger, bitterness and resentment stemmed from losing the ability to enjoy all the things that come with human existence, being forced to adapt to a body that became her prison. Perhaps, in the beginning, she even retained her human mind, fully understanding what was happening to her and remembering her experiences from her human life. Let's not forget that Voldemort was fluent in parcel tongue and had a special connection with snakes. They could find him and he could attract them to him. It's very likely that this is what led to his meeting with Nagini, who, after so many years of silence, finally found someone who could understand her and communicate with her. There's a theory that they first met in the forests of Albania, and we know that Voldemort can be charming and persuasive, achieving whatever he wants thanks to his natural charisma. At that point, Nagini may have desperately needed someone to talk to after years of loneliness, which is why it's no surprise that Tom Riddle became her only friend and ally. Interestingly, Nagini became more to Voldemort than any of his Death Eaters. In his treatment of her, there are even hints of care, if that word can be applied to Voldemort. He made her his partner in shaping the future of the magical world. Nagini became someone Voldemort could trust unconditionally, someone who would never betray him. Moreover, he made her a horcrux, the vessel for a fragment of his soul, which further strengthened the bond between them. The most terrifying part of Nagini's curse is that it consumes her identity and personality. Every day she spends less time in her human form, gradually accepting that she will eventually remain in an animal's body forever. Before becoming Voldemort's murderous snake, Nagini was a shy, quiet and timid woman. 
Fantastic Beasts shows us that she was friends with Credence Barebone, who helped her escape from the circus. Perhaps their friendship was based on the fact that both felt like outsiders in the world, searching for their place in it. Moreover, Nagini wanted to help Credence discover his origins and find his parents. Despite Nagini being the embodiment of evil and darkness in Harry Potter, in Fantastic Beasts, we see that she stood on the light side. She realized Grindelwald's true intentions and tried to persuade Credence not to join him. After losing Credence in the story's final events, Nagini sided with Newt Scamander, leaving no doubt about her choice in the magical world's conflict. But how did a kind and helpful woman turn into Voldemort's malevolent snake? It's likely because in some ways Voldemort and Nagini were alike. Both were lost in the world, which by the way is somewhat reminiscent of Credence's situation. Nagini was trapped in her snake form, with no one to even have a simple conversation with, and Voldemort, disembodied after the events at Godric's Hollow, also felt complete isolation, left without followers or the life he had once lived. Perhaps this shared loneliness brought them closer, and each had something to offer the other. Without Nagini, Voldemort wouldn't have regained his body so quickly. Her venom helped him survive, sustaining his life force. And without Voldemort, Nagini would have had no reason to live, nor anyone with whom to share her existence. After Bertha Jorkin's murder, their bond grew even stronger, as Nagini became a horcrux, and a part of Voldemort's soul now lived within her. It's likely that at this point, Nagini permanently lost the remnants of her good and kind soul becoming a weapon in Voldemort's hands, to whom she was completely devoted. Now, she could communicate with him telepathically and carry out all his commands from afar. Surprisingly, despite his dark nature, Nagini was unconditionally loyal to Voldemort, and the Dark Lord cared for her more than any of his human followers. If we look at it overall, we see an example of how two lonely souls found support in each other. If Voldemort had different goals and worldview, perhaps the world would have gained one more happy life. Nagini's story, filled with tragedy and transforming her from a human into Voldemort's loyal servant, shows how fate can warp even the most innocent. But Nagini is not the only character in the world of Harry Potter whose life has been so dark and ambiguous. In the magical world, many heroes have actions and fates that seem questionable, but behind them are always complex stories. Let's move on to other characters and explore nine of them whose tragedies and inner conflicts make us see them in a different light. Number 1. Petunia Dursley Petunia Dursley is a woman who immediately evokes dislike. She is strict, cold, and seems to despise Harry. At first glance, she appears cruel without reason. But behind this facade lie emotions that aren't visible right away. Petunia was always jealous of her sister Lily. Lily was a witch, special, and Petunia, an ordinary girl. She dreamed of being the same wrote letters to Hogwarts, and hoped that she would also be accepted. But there were no replies. Lily lived in the magical world, while Petunia remained in the world of muggles. Jealousy grew, turning into resentment and pain. More than jealousy, Petunia felt fear. Magic frightened her. This world, with its dangers, was alien and incomprehensible. When Lily died, Petunia decided that magic had destroyed her family. Harry, who ended up on her doorstep, wasn't just a child, but a reminder that this world only brought death and pain. She tried to protect herself and her family by closing her heart to her nephew. But behind this cruelty lay responsibility. In Order of the Phoenix Dumbledore reminds us that Petunia knew about the protection Harry's mother had given him. She could have kicked him out, but she didn't. She understood that by keeping him in the house, she was protecting him from Voldemort. It was her duty to her deceased sister. She hated this duty, but still fulfilled it. 
a deleted scene from Deathly Hallows shows how deeply Petunia felt all of this. In it, she tells Harry, I lost a sister too. This phrase is the key to her inner world. She hid her feelings and couldn't openly show the pain she felt from losing Lily. Number 2. Narcissa Malfoy Narcissa Malfoy always seems cold and unreachable, an arrogant aristocrat loyal to the dark forces and Voldemort. But her true essence is revealed in one thing, her boundless love for her son. Draco is the meaning of Narcissa's life. When Voldemort assigns her son the task of killing Dumbledore, she knows Draco won't manage it. In desperation, she goes to Severus Snape. She begs him to help. To save Draco, Narcissa makes an unbreakable vow, showing that she's willing to do anything to protect him. But that's just the beginning. During the final battle, when Voldemort believes he has killed Harry, he orders Narcissa to check him. She leans over Harry and quietly asks, Is Draco alive? In that moment, all that matters to her is her son's fate. Learning that Draco is safe, Narcissa deceives Voldemort. She tells him Harry is dead, though she knows he's not. This moment isn't an act of mercy. It's not an attempt to help the Order of the Phoenix. It's maternal instinct. Narcissa saves Harry solely to return to her son. Number 3. Creature Creature, the loyal house elf of the Black family, symbolized devotion even when his masters were long gone. He remained in the empty house, loyal to the memory of the Blacks, despite the terrible treatment he had endured. His life was a tragedy of loyalty, even at the cost of his own well-being. The Black family treated him harshly. They saw Creature not as a person, but as a thing, a tool for carrying out their orders. Despite this, he stayed devoted. For him, servitude was everything. Even when humiliated and mistreated, he continued to follow the will of his masters. The most important bond Creature had was with Regulus Black. When Regulus decided to destroy one of Voldemort's Horcruxes, he sent Creature on a deadly mission. Creature survived this horror but returned, remaining loyal to his master until the end. He kept this secret for many years, continuing to honour Regulus's memory. Creature is a metaphor for the oppressed. He symbolises those who are deprived of freedom and voice. His fate was to live under someone else's will, without the opportunity to choose his own path. His entire life was a chain of commands he had to carry out, no matter the consequences. When Harry Potter became Creature's new master, the elf initially hated him. For Creature, no one could replace the Black family. But over time, Harry showed him respect and care, which changed everything. Creature began to see Harry not just as a master, but as someone who treated him with humanity. Number 4. Neville Longbottom Neville Longbottom started as the most insecure student in Gryffindor, shy, clumsy, and often the target of ridicule. But behind his shyness was deep pain. His parents, Frank and Alice Longbottom, were tortured into madness by Bellatrix Lestrange. Neville grew up without them, raised by a strict grandmother who considered him weak. But Neville was stronger than he seemed. Despite his slow development of magical abilities, he never gave up. His relatives almost considered him a squib, but Neville proved them wrong. Each year at Hogwarts, he grew more confident. His path was difficult, but he moved forward without looking back at the mockery. The turning point came when Neville faced Bellatrix Lestrange. The witch who destroyed his family no longer scared him. Neville's courage, long hidden, emerged. In that moment, he turned his pain into strength and stopped being a victim. Neville's most triumphant moment was during the final battle at Hogwarts. When everyone thought Harry was dead and the battle was lost, Neville stood before Voldemort. Without hesitation, he cut off Nagini's head with the sword of Gryffindor, destroying the last Horcrux. This was the moment when Neville became a hero. His story teaches us to believe in ourselves, even when no one else does. He was once weak, but became strong. 
His journey is a testament that you can become a hero by overcoming difficulties. Neville never gave up despite his fears and pain. Number 5. Rufus Scrimger Rufus Scrimger came to power during dark times. As the new Minister of Magic, he seemed ready to protect the magical community from Voldemort. A former Aura, he was strong, decisive, and unafraid of the enemy. But his confidence turned into a mistake. Scrimger believed that the Ministry's power could solve all problems. He increased control, made arrests, and demonstrated authority. However, Voldemort was craftier. Scrimger relied too much on showy strength, not realizing that the enemy was working from within, destroying the system. This was his biggest mistake. He underestimated the threat. Instead of seeking allies and fighting with wisdom, he tried to maintain the illusion of control. He arrested the innocent to show he was in charge, but he failed to see the real dangers. Voldemort exploited his weaknesses. When the Death Eaters took over the Ministry, Scrimger was powerless. He was captured, tortured, but he didn't betray Harry Potter. Even on the brink of death, he remained loyal to his mission. This was his moment of true bravery, but also of tragic failure. Scrimger's courage couldn't save him. He died a hero, but his mistakes led to the fall of the Ministry. His death symbolized the collapse of power built on fear and control, not wisdom and strategy. His leadership lacked flexibility. Scrimger didn't understand that the fight against Voldemort wasn't just a war. It was a battle for the trust of the people. He didn't seek allies like the Order of the Phoenix, and he realized too late that to win, one needed not just to display power, but to act with intelligence. Number 6. Molly Weasley Molly Weasley is the heart and soul of the Weasley family, loving, caring, yet incredibly strong. She raised seven children, but her care extended to Harry Potter as well. Molly became for him what he had always lacked, a real mother. When Harry first arrived at the burrow, he immediately felt at home. Molly fed him, cared for him, and knitted Christmas sweaters for him, just like she did for her own children. She made no distinction between her own and others. Harry was her boy just as much as Ron or Ginny. Molly worried about Harry during the most difficult moments of his life. She knew that dangers awaited him and always fretted over him like her own son. Her love knew no bounds, and that made her special. For her, family wasn't about blood, but about care and affection. Her care was evident in the small things, the breakfasts she prepared for everyone, her constant concern for each child, whether it was Ron, Harry, or even Hermione. Molly created a real home for all of them, where everyone could feel safe. But Molly wasn't just a housewife. Her strength manifested when she fought Bellatrix Lestrange. When Bellatrix threatened Ginny, Molly showed what a mother was capable of. Her famous line, Not my daughter, you bitch, became a symbol of maternal fury and protection, and she won. In that moment, Molly proved that a mother's love for her children is the strongest magic. She wasn't a great duelist, but her heart burned for those she loved. For them, she was ready to fight anyone, and her love was stronger than dark magic. Number 7. Draco Malfoy Draco Malfoy was always someone people loved to hate. A Slytherin from a pure-blood family, he had learned ideals of blood purity and arrogance from a young age. Harry Potter was his sworn enemy, and his entire life at Hogwarts seemed to be a constant struggle with Gryffindor. But behind this image was a boy torn by inner conflicts. Draco had lived under pressure since childhood. His father, Lucius Malfoy, expected blind loyalty to Voldemort and the Dark Forces. This wasn't Draco's choice, it was his family's. Inside him, there was always a struggle between who he was supposed to be and who he wanted to be. His anger and arrogance were a shield to protect himself from the fear of disappointing his parents. 
This internal battle peaked when Voldemort tasked him with killing Dumbledore. Draco never wanted to be a murderer. He wasn't cruel by nature. We see throughout his sixth year at Hogwarts how he suffers under the weight of this mission. Too much responsibility rested on his shoulders, and he clearly wasn't coping. When Draco stood before Dumbledore with his wand, he hesitated. In that moment, we saw Draco's true feelings, fear, despair, and confusion over how to get out of this situation. He didn't want to kill, but was afraid of Voldemort. Even in the face of death, Dumbledore tried to help him, knowing that inside, Draco wasn't evil, but in pain and afraid. During the final battle at Hogwarts, Draco distanced himself further from evil. He no longer participated in the battle with enthusiasm. He didn't want to be part of this dark world. His parents were on Voldemort's side, but Draco's heart wasn't with them anymore. He was looking for a way out. Number 8. Severus Snape Severus Snape was always an enigma, a grim, cold potions professor feared by almost all students. From day one, Harry Potter saw him as an enemy. But behind this stern exterior was a story of love, pain and sacrifice that shaped his destiny. Snape had been in love with Lily Evans since childhood. This love never faded, even when Lily married James Potter, whom Snape hated. His love became even stronger after the tragic mistake he made when he passed on the prophecy to Voldemort, which led to Lily's death. This moment became his eternal curse. After her death, Snape switched sides, joining Dumbledore and becoming a double agent. He lived with constant guilt, protecting Harry Potter, the son of the woman he loved, even though Harry reminded him of James. His love for Lily became the driving force of his life, even if it meant playing the role of an enemy. The most powerful part of his story was revealed in Deathly Hallows, when Harry learned the truth about Snape. His Patronus, in the shape of a doe, the image of Lily, symbolized his undying devotion. Snape's one word, always, opened his heart. He had always loved Lily, even after her death, and he protected Harry for her sake. Snape's love wasn't a simple romance. It was a force that guided his entire life. His actions, even the darkest ones, were driven by his deep attachment to Lily. He lived to atone for his mistake with her. Snape could have remained loyal to Voldemort, but his love made him a hero. His life was full of pain and contradictions, but he chose the side of good. He never sought fame. His heroism was hidden and quiet. Thank you for watching until the end. I hope this means you found it interesting. And if so, don't forget to like, share your thoughts in the comments and subscribe to the channel.